brothers and sisters in Christ, we welcome here your two St. Pauls on this wonderful June morning. I am honored to be here. I feel very uh, grateful when Pastor Dietmar asked me to come and join with all of you, um, and so I can share uh, with what I have learned and my own experiences. We hope that Dietmar is having a excellent time of vacationing and getting away. Um, we also hope that there are no accidents. I know that he was going hiking, and I know that it was going to be hot where he was going to be at. So hopefully if everything uh, is fine as they are out enjoying themselves in God's nature. Uh, there are many announcements. Make sure that you are subscribed to the newsletter and you have the opportunity to read through those things. Um, one particular plug that, of course, I always enjoy and try to participate with my family is the Messy Church. We had a wonderful time last week. Uh, the kids talk about it. They love the activities. They love the stories. Um, and, of course, they love the hot dogs. So, you know, that's something that they look forward to. So with that... Let's center our hearts and our minds as we prepare ourselves for the worship of our God.
brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather for worship, I want to start off today discussing the idea of Father. God has many images in the Bible, and since God is beyond our perception, oftentimes we use our human capacity to describe who God is to us. Now, on this day in particular, many of us have had many wonderful and excellent memories of our fathers. And as a father, there's nothing that warms my heart more than the little boys coming in and the littlest one saying out loud in the early days, in the early morning, Happy Father's Day, Mother. <laughs> Thankfully, I have a nine-year-old daughter who explained to the three-year-old that no, <laughs> we wish Dad Happy Father's Day. And then he got really excited because he said, oh, I didn't know it was Dad's birthday today. <laughs> but for many, this day is not joyous. As I said before, I have very happy memories of my father, and there are many stories that I could tell, and I've heard many stories about other people's fathers, but there are those of who are among us who their image of father does not resonate with love and kindness and forgiveness and grace. And for those, when they hear God as father, it is not one of compassion and welcoming, it is one of fear it is one of punishment. It is one of no loving relationship whatsoever. And so as we go through our service today and we use the word father, as we use this word as God, as the ideal father, we have to acknowledge also the ways in which we have brokenness among us. And for many of us who are out there, maybe father isn't the image that's best associated with God. But my favorite thing comes from a nun who talked about God as father, not because it reminded her of her own father, but simply because he reminded that God reminded her of what a father could potentially be. And so she replaced those images with God and felt like that was the ideal archetype of father. So let's join in with our hearts today as we sing together, This Is My Father's World, hymn number 370. As Christians, we are called to confess our sins, and as a Christian community, what we do is we come together and acknowledge the ways that we have not achieved the bar that God has intended for us. So as a collective, let us confess our sins to God. Father, we are sorry for the many times we have left you and chosen to satisfy our own selfish desires. 
for the times we have hurt the members of our families by refusing to do our share of the family tasks, for the times we were unkind and impatient with those who needed our time and concern, for the times we were too weak to stand up for what was right and allowed others to suffer because of our cowardice, for the times we refused to give others. We share with you what is on our hearts. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear these good, the good news. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we were made. He remembers that we are dust. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. This, my friend, is good news. Amen. clamor of life's loudest scene, when a voice that notes in a tremulous note far over my sea of dreaming, I remember the dim old vestry and my father kneeling there, and the old hymns thrill with the memory still of my father's voice in prayer. I can see the glance of approval as my part in the hymn I took. I remember the grace of my mother's face and the tenderness of her look. And I knew that a gracious memory casts its light on that face so fair as her cheeks flushed faint, oh mother my saint, at my father's voice in prayer. Neath the stress of that marvelous pleading, all childish dissensions died. Each rebellious will sank conquered and still in a passion of love and pride. Ah, the years have held dear voices and melodies tender and rare. But tenderest seems the voice of my dreams, my father's voice in prayer. This is a poem entitled, My Father's Voice in Prayer, 
written by Ney Hastings Nottage prior to boys and girls and happy Father's Day to all those dads out there. You know when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today for a children's message about Father's Day I went to the internet as people often do. I was looking for a little inspiration. I thought maybe I would find some messages there that would be helpful to me and I actually did but not in the way that I thought. A lot of the messages about Father's Day that I found uh, focused a lot on what fathers do. And in fact, there was one message that s suggested that uh, you demonstrate uh, many of the things that fathers do. And they suggest, for instance, holding up a tool, a pair of pliers and saying, you know, fathers fix things for us around the house. And holding up a little car and saying, fathers help keep our cars running. They change the oil and keep them clean and also holding up some money to demonstrate that our fathers make money and help us to be able to afford clothing and food and music lessons and a house to live in and a car to, to ride around in and all the things that uh, dads do around the house that are so important. And I thought, you know, those are important, but when I think of a father, I think of my own father when I was growing up, he certainly didn't fix many cars, that's for sure. But my dad, and I'm sure that your dads out there, uh, are people who always supported you. They were looking after you. They were protecting you. And I think that's what I like to think of when I think of dads. Now, since this is Father's Day, it is a perfect time to remember all they say and do and to say thank you. If you don't have a dad living with you, make sure you say thankful to the people that help look after you. That's important because there are people in your lives who can be father figures and, and not necessarily your uh, actual dad, but they can be father figures and do things for you like encouraging and protecting and supporting you. And the Bible says that all of us have God as our father as well. So we want to remember that we all have a father, a father in heaven. Although we can't see him, he knows us, he watches over us, and he loves us so much. So I hope you can take time today to say thank you to your dad or whoever looks after you. And take time to say thank you to God, our heavenly father, because he is looking after us too. Let's bow our heads in a moment of prayer. Thank you, God, for dads. They are very important, and we are grateful for all they do. Also, thank you for all the people that look after us and care for us. We also want to thank you, God, because all of us have you as a wonderful Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and have a great Father's Day. Help us to be like David. 
by being faithful and praying for help in difficult situations. Help us to be brave. Help us to hear your word so that we may truly understand. The account of David's fight with Goliath is a well-known parable found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. The story goes that Goliath, a giant and champion, challenged the Israelites for many days to send out their own champion and decide the outcome of their war. Goliath was so terrifying that none of the Israelites dared to face him. Um, all except for a young shepherd named David. David trusted that his God, the Lord, would support David in striking down Goliath and delivering uh, victory to the Israelites. Today's scripture is from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 through 47. Saul clothed David with his armor, he put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor and tried to walk in vain, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I'm not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones and put them in a shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the fields. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into his hand. The next scripture is from Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. And Jesus has asked his followers uh, to join him in crossing the lake uh, during a, a major storm. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was the dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with a great awe and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Here ends the reading. Thank you.
So last summer, my two sons, Oliver and Dakota, were running around the house yelling at each other, Come here, boy, and I'll kill you. Why they jumped off the couch and swung their white sabers around haphazardly, barely missing each other's heads and other objects in their proximity. I'm still amazed I haven't had to buy a new TV yet. Jamie, of course, was appalled by this phrase that they were using and told him to stop it. Now, normally this doesn't stop anything, but they were compliant this time and they ended using that phrase, at least near us. Later on that evening, while Jamie and I were making supper, we heard the phrase still being used, come here, boy, and I'll kill you, as they play, wrestled, and make-believed upstairs. So Jamie and I began a conversation. Where are they getting this language? And, and Jamie had asked me, um, do you have any of that language in your video games? Now, one of my favorite pastimes with the kids is we sit down and we play our Nintendo Switch and we go adventuring. And so we have Mario and Zelda. And yes, there are some battles and things like that that's going on, but it's mostly killing bacoblins. And the main protagonist doesn't say a lot except like hiya and it lets it go. So, you know, there's not a lot of like violence towards them. So then we wondered, are they getting it from like a YouTube streamer that they watch on some of their video games? However, it's, it's actually very, very G-rated, the ones they can access. So it's kind of mystery to us where they picked up this particular language. Well, later in the week, it was in the evening, Jamie had sat down, the boys were finally dressed for bed and had their teeth brushed, and they wanted her to read one of their favorite stories from the children's Bible, which is David and Goliath. And as she sat down and read to them, there was this phrase that was uttered by Goliath towards David, come here, boy, and I'll kill you. Now, Jamie read right over it without any hesitation, not even thinking about it, and I burst out laughing. When she asked what was so hilarious, I said, it's the Bible. That's where they're getting the violent phrase. And she said, oh, well, how do I change that phrase? I was like, well, don't go biblical because it's a lot worse. <laughs> but it got me thinking, and I actually did a Sunday school on this one time in Arizona. Kids' stories in the Bible aren't so kid-friendly, right? Jonah and the whale, man gets swallowed by a whale, spit out in the desert, you know, some of these things actually have violent images, but we're, we're in, we have that since the beginning. We are taught from early ages about power and battle and death and like overcoming your enemies. It's a very common motif. I mean, very early on, many of us have heard the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, right? David and Goliath. These stories permeate throughout our culture. The David and Goliath story is so common that we hear it regularly without any context. If you're any fan of a sport, uh, of any sports, you always hear about the David and Goliath matches. David, the young startup, the, uh, the underdog who comes and they defeat the champion. And in our story today, one thing is very clear. Goliath is the champion. Now, this idea of kind of trotting out two warriors to face each other in an in individual battle is actually very common during this time period. War is expensive. It's expensive to keep armies upkept. It's expensive to have new materials. So rather than waste their resources on the battles fighting each other, oftentimes they would come together, choose their particular champion, they would fight each other, and then the loser would agree to a certain terms of agreement and then next year they would come meet again. So the Israelites are trying to figure out who's going to face this champion. And they were delaying their choice in order to strategize. Now, this is a problem to our modern mindset because it's a strange scene. We don't do this in our modern military mindset. We don't have armies continually march out during the springtime to war. Uh, winning the battle for these armies meant peace and security for another year. And Saul has a pretty superior force, but he doesn't have that champion. And this is a problem for Saul because he doesn't want to negotiate with the Philistines or the Philistines. 
times, uh, he wants to beat them so that he doesn't have to agree to these lower terms. So Saul needs to save face when David arrives and demands that he is going to be selected to take on Goliath. But Saul has to dress him properly. Because you just can't send anyone out there to face this champion. You need to have the finest dressed person, the most hardened military person. And so they put on David all the best armor to make him look impressive out in the field. Because those are the hardened military men. At the other end were these peasant slingers. The slingshot was a very common weapon in military during the ancient times. Many of them used them. Of course, most of it was from the peasantry who couldn't afford the more expensive armor or the more powerful weapons. So letting David go out there and face Goliath looking like a peasant slinger was just about one of the most humiliating things that Saul could do for his army or for his kingdom. Even by sending David to face Goliath with a slingshot, would have said that the best that I could muster is a peasant boy. And so it would have been very humiliating for him. And yet, here's David, a simple peasant shepherd, with his slingshot to take on Goliath. And the statement he makes about God is also not very unusual for this time. Many people would have dedicated their victories to a god or to the gods, and so oftentimes these battles were seen as a way to which God is more powerful. Moving over to our gospel message, we're also dealing with a power. The power here is the power of nature and the storm that rages upon the Sea of Galilee. Jesus and his disciples have been preaching all day to the masses through parables, and Jesus tells his disciples, let's cross over the Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus... And his disciples are out in the middle of Galilee when a storm arises. And when the storm arises, it not only threatens to sink the boat, but it also threatens to kill all those who are there. But Jesus is very unconcerned about this, as our biblical message today says that Jesus is sleeping on a cushion. Why a cushion? I actually don't know. I actually tried to read about this, but none of the commentaries gave a very clear answer, and some were quite speculative in nature. For me personally, I remember dad napping on a pillow, and what it brings in my image is that Jesus was so exhausted, he could literally sleep in a boat on a small pillow while the waves were crushing over him. So I don't want to focus too much on the pillow in and of itself, but I want to focus on the fact that storms are a sign of the gods. Storms for centuries have been attributed to particular gods and God's angers or God's frustration. So oftentimes when a storm or natural disaster hit, it was attributed that some god had brought this upon them. And of course, so the disciples want to wake God, Jesus up, and they want to like have him battle this storm, or they want to like have this power on display. So really what we're talking about in this passage is very similar to the David and Goliath story. Jesus is facing another God. Jesus is facing the storm, the waves, the wind, the lightning, the thunder. And what we are anticipating is the answer of the question, who is more powerful or which one is more powerful? So let's connect these two scenes together. One, both Jesus and David are faced with significant opposition. Both of them seem very calm in the face of what could be a catastrophe. Both of these stories have the larger motif of powers, two powers that seem insurmountable. Ever been on a small boat in a storm in the middle of a lake? Have you ever been in the middle where you, don't, you feel very vulnerable? What can David do in the face of Goliath? What can Jesus do in the face of a storm? And yet when both stories end, it is not the powerful that are standing, but it is the young boy with the slingshot, and it is Jesus who just recently was napping on a cushion. In June 15, 2014, 
It was Father's Day, and it would happen to be the last time that I talked with my own father. I had called him to wish him a happy Father's Day and let him know how the job search was going. You see, I had just recently been laid off from my teaching position due to budget cuts and was having very little luck finding another job, which was a large distress in Jamie and my life at that time, simply because she was going to graduate school finishing her doctorate, and so I was the primary earner during that time for benefits and money. I wasn't very chatty with dad that day, part of the reason because I wasn't feeling very good about where my life was and didn't feel like he should be very proud of me at that moment. But another reason was because we had made the decision that we were coming home in two weeks to see everyone. All the family was congregating back in South Dakota. Unfortunately, dad had heart issues and while he was switching medications and he was out working, preparing for the arrival of us, he was tired, and so he said to his brother, as he was tiling a floor, he said, you know, I'm kind of tired, I want to lay down. And it was there that his heart just stopped working. I remember getting the call while driving back from South Dakota, and for everything else that was going on in my life, it just felt like another wave of a storm that crashed over me. Now, this is the part of the story that I'm supposed to tell you that we went out and slew Goliath. This is the part of the story where I said that Jesus is supposed to rise up and calm the waves. But unfortunately, the Christian story doesn't always end like that. And that's part of what I want to talk about today. Because here's the thing about Christianity. A lot of times it feels, as an individual, as a community, that we are like David and Goliath in the battle, or that we are in the middle of a storm. And if you're here today because you love winning, you love being on top, if you love power, that's just not the story of Christianity. Christianity, very few times in this world, has been in the center of power, has been in those positions to make the decision or overcome or conquer. Most times what we hear about with God and the Israelites and Christians is working from the margins, working for those people who are dispossessed, working in those places where the power is most absent. And that doesn't mean that there aren't great victories. That doesn't mean that Christ doesn't overcome and that God doesn't break in and that we don't conquer in those particular time periods. But I would say for most of us, our experience is of the storm and create and, 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 and reaching out to God and crying out to God. And so the Christian experience is about how we find strength in the midst of those sufferings, how we work together to stand together in community, and we with Christ shout in the face of that storm that we will not lose heart, that we will not let the waves overcome us, that we will not succumb to those who are powerful. And so as a Christian community, we stand in solidarity with each other and continue to fight even when the odds are against us, even when the world, like Goliath, is laughing at our meager contributions or meager attempts with a slingshot. So when the world calls for punishment, we stand and call for grace and forgiveness. When the world desires war, we gather together to pray for peace. When the world is bent towards injustice, we as Christians stand up and practice justice and righteousness. When the world practices exclusiveness, we as Christians welcome people into the heart of God and Christ. We stand together as a community of believers to face the storm together. And I think that that is our David and Jesus moment, in that we come together as Christians and we face the insurmountable, oftentimes in our daily lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We come to a time of opening our hearts and our gifts and our talents to God. God has everything in abundance, but yet what we give him is pure joy. As a father receives a gift from his children, so does God delight in whatever we offer to him.
Let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather together in the midst of the storms. We gather to sing your praises, to worship you, to listen to you, and to strengthen one another. And together we pray for the injustices of this world. We pray for those who are held without cause. We pray for those whom the justice system is out of reach because it is set up for those who can afford high-quality lawyers and support their preferred judges. We pray for those who are in prisons, not because they are bad people, but because they were not offered the resources and opportunities that many of their peers had and thus were forced to make choices that led them there. We pray for those around the globe who find themselves in the midst of war-torn storms. Those who live daily in places like Palestine and Israel, who never can feel quite secure in their daily activities. We pray for the people of Syria, in which the next generation growing up has never known peace and only conflict. We pray for the people of Yemen, whose country is used by larger powers as a proxy war, and it is crushing their entire country and devastating it. We pray for those who have been displaced and await the day when they can go home. We pray for the Uyghurs of China who have been placed in re-education camps and forced to renounce their culture, their ways, in order to conform to a government standard. We pray for our sisters and brothers in North Korea whose leader has openly admitted publicly that they are, that they are facing challenging times for the entire country when it comes to food scarcity. Yet their leadership continues to pursue military supremacy through nuclearization rather than opening itself to the global markets and feeding their people. We pray for our local community that surrounds us. We pray for the partisan divide that cleaves our community and harasses one another on social media. We pray for those who consume news media and are led into believing that their enemies are their neighbors who vote differently rather than the systems of oppression that surround us. We pray for those who go hungry and live in substandard housing while speculative buyers hoard millions of square feet of homes that are vacant because it is termed a good investment. And we pray for those who suffer and do not have access to proper health care or mental services. Thus they live their lives, but it is one of facing a Goliath every single day. And they begin to wonder how long they can hold it off or when it will defeat them. We pray for our congregation, those who are facing surgeries, those who are facing issues within their own family, those who are missing loved ones or who have just recently had a loved one pass away. We pray for those who are in between jobs or who are trapped in a job simply because it's the only thing available to them. And so out of the midst of this storm, O oh God, we call out with one voice the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, we 
So interesting story with the Lord's Prayer. My, my good friend Phil, his dad has been a pastor for like 35, 40 years, right? And one of the things that he told me and his son was that I always write out the Lord's Prayer. It's like I was preaching for about 23 years, and on some random Sunday, I was saying the Lord's Prayer, and I got to the third line, and my mind blanked. And he said, I froze and I stopped, and the entire congregation stopped with me. (laughs) And I had to ask for the next line from the congregation. (laughs) So I'm always concerned, and I didn't write it out. I'm saying this because I didn't write it out today, so it's not on my notes. And about halfway through, I got very nervous (laughs) that I was going to forget it. But thanks to the excellent tech team here, they have it up there, and I appreciate that because I can always remember that. All right, brothers and sisters, hear the benediction. Beloved children of the Father, are you in the midst of a storm? Are you facing your Goliath? Are you feeling as though the next wave will swallow you and your life? May you stand in solidarity with other Christians around you. May you feel the support and the love that the kingdom of God has to offer. May we become Jesus' hands and feet and bring the good news in real and tangible ways for the kingdom of God to others. And may the peace that passes all understanding be with you now and always. Amen. Thank you to shine like the sun.